Oh, on behalf of the Inner Wheel Club of Coventry, I would like to welcome Sue. Sue is a business lady from this area who has won a number of prizes for her work. And she's also a keynote speaker and trainer. And as you can see by the picture, Hydro Veg. So welcome, Sue. We're looking forward to hearing you today. Thank you and Happy New Year, everybody. Lovely Thank to you. see you all. And old smiling faces, which is brilliant. Yeah, my name's Sue, Sue Tonks. And uh, I'm a Bedworth kid for those that are uh, you know, the other side of Fosal Road. Um, and I live in Nuneaton at the moment. But most of my uh, life since I was at university, I've lived in the north. So if you can sense a bit of a northern accent, but that's because I brought it back down with me. All right. So I'm an international speaker and trainer. Um, all for the last 27 years, I've done leadership and management training. And currently, when I'm not speaking to you, I'm sitting down trying to finish my first book, which is a management book. So those that have been in management or have, have got family will know the words, can I have a word? Do you know those words? When somebody says, can I have a word? And it's all the things that that evokes. So, so my management book is about dealing with performance behavior and attitude in the workplace in a way that doesn't cause people to, to feel um, worried or, or anxious or, and doesn't lose control. So that's what I'm doing when I'm not speaking to you because my Hydra Veg business, which uh, I created, I'm the inventor of a project called Hydra Veg. Um, that's in hibernation at the moment because I'm not building any kits until, uh, until February to send them out. So I've got a little bit more time on my hands. So other than an international speaker and trainer, I've actually got eight businesses. So yeah, we've got properties, we've got all sorts of things. And I even earn money at night. I call myself a woween, a woman who earns at night because I've got some investments that earn me some money while I'm asleep. Most important thing for me over the COVID period is to have a whole mix of things to do so when some things I couldn't do, like my speaking and the trading, um, then I've been able to earn some money from other things that I do. So I thought, first of all, I'll tell you a little bit about Hydra Veg. So I have just fetched from my garden this broccoli, okay? And the reason why it's in a bag is because it actually, if I just take the bag away, it's still quite frozen. Whoops, there it is. That root's still quite frozen there. And you think, well, why on earth is there a root hanging about? Well, hydroponic growing is about growing um, vegetables all the way through the year with no digging and weeding, no slugs and snails, no soil. It waters itself and it, there's no bending because it's vertical and on this kit here which is out in my garden at the minute um you can grow up to 120 veg in no space so it's the size of a fence panel and this one here which is what we call a midi kit that's about four foot wide and about four and a half foot tall and that grows up to about 76 plants and you'll notice on that one there not only is the vegetables there's also really nice flowers so I invented this because I had a need to grow um, and I didn't, I didn't want to have to do all the digging and the weeding. My soil outside is really awful. And uh, there was just, I, I, looked, I had to look on the system and there was just nothing to buy. So, um, so five years ago, um, I just drew what I wanted to, to have and then sent a picture to my friend in Manchester and said, could you build me this frame? And he drove down from Manchester with a frame and then I just set up trying to organize how to do it. So the, 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 we've won loads of awards, Green Business of the Year Award in Wales. We've won awards with the Federation of Small Businesses. We were even the Green Business for the Coventry Evening Telegraph two years ago, um, and which is, which is just really fabulous accolades. And my Hydra Veg, where is it going? Well, um, we're working on it to get out to the developing world because it uses 30% um, 
That's an, that's an office, 70%, yeah. Sorry, 70 percent less water than a normal garden and it grows 30 percent faster. So we're getting the we're, we're organizing it so we can try and get the trials to get the um, kits out to the developing world because they'll feed families uh, with the kit. And we don't just grow little tiny, tiny things. I mean, we're talking about this is a broccoli. <laughs> so this is a broccoli. It's only it's small because I put it in quite late um, in end of October, but it's doing quite nicely now. There's cabbages, uh, purple sprouting, broccoli, kale, spinach, tomatoes, courgettes, aubergines, all of those things that we can grow in the kit. Mm -hmm. And we also go to school. So the pictures at the bottom, is when we go to school. So we take the kids to school, we build it with the children. It covers maths, physics, chemistry, biology, design, and nutrition. Uh, and so while we're building it, the kids were talking to them about all the science behind it, uh, why the angles are the angles, what sort of water has to go around, what, what happens if the water runs out in the box. And then, and of course, the nutrients that they have to give because the plants are just living in water and nutrients because there's no soil. And in the pot there, my uh, tape out there, there are little clay balls. And these clay balls are there not to feed the plant, but just to keep the plant upright in the pot as it doesn't wander about in the wind. So that supports it, just like the soil would um, support the plant um, in the ground. So everything that happens in the soil happens in hydroponics, but we just don't have the soil. Um, and you might be thinking, well, she's brought it in and it was frozen. Yes, it works even in the winter because these are all winter veg. Now, this we wouldn't have uh, a tomato growing this time of year because you wouldn't. Um, but in the winter veg, they're all brassicas. So the brassicas, if it was frosty like it is today, really frosty today, they would freeze in the ground anyway. Um, and then they defrost. And that's exactly the same for the hydro veg. So I'll fetch that one in from the frost and I shall pop it back um, in, its, in its hole in its pot a bit later on. So one of the other things that's really quite exciting is last year, um, a university, Durham University contacted me and said that they, they were doing some trials of a gel. So instead of the plant growing in water and nutrients, it would grow in a gel and the gel would be both the water and the nutrients. So you wouldn't ever have to water the plant and you wouldn't have to feed the plant because this gel would do it all. And so they asked to, to, for three hydro veg kits, one that's got the water running around as normal and two that are sealed on the ends. So it doesn't have water running through and to, we'll put the gel in there. And the reason for that is that they've got one that's in a sort of botanical garden and one that's um, in laboratory conditions. And they're measuring the growth in the ordinary hydro veg kit with the growth of the, the, the food in the other two kits. If this works, and it's very early stages yet, but if it works, then that will go out to the developing world to feed families because they won't need to worry about where they're gonna get the water from they won't need electricity and they won't need additional food for the plants because everything will be provided for in the gel. So that's really quite exciting where we're going with that. And the other thing is, I don't know whether you know, but NASA have been have spent $7 billion trying to sort out how to grow veg when the astronauts go to Mars. Um, because it's going to take five years for the astronauts to get to Mars and they can't take all the food with them. So they're going to have to grow it en route. And water in a negative um, uh, uh, environment um, reacts differently. You've seen uh, in, the state, in the station, uh, the space station, that the water sort of fold, runs around. Well, they can't have it doing that. So they've been trying to find a way to get hydroponic plants growing out of in the space. And uh, so this gel may be the answer to that too. So we're really quite excited where that's gonna go because that gel might take the astronauts on their journey to Mars. So that's the hydroponic world uh, that I'm in. Now, most people, if you think about hydroponics, they think about all the things that people grow that they get arrested for. 
and I must be the only magistrate that's actually involved in hydroponic growing. Um, so that's been part of a bit of a challenge really, and I make sure that my hydro veg kit is only up for outdoors and it doesn't have lights and it doesn't have to be in the loft and use somebody else's electric. So, so it's quite fun being a magistrate involved in hydroponics. The other thing that I do, um, and I should have been doing this week actually, but because of COVID, we've put it on for a few weeks, is I'm a, an international speaker on networking. And I travel all over universities throughout the country and overseas, um, helping MBA students, PhDs, accountants, lawyers, um, professional people and business people to network um, better and easier in order to have a better way of um, getting business to them. And we all know that during this lockdown, we've done so much on Zoom and I've had to write so many programs about networking on Zoom for businesses. And uh, with a bit of luck, with a bit of luck, one of my first overseas gigs is going to be in May, which is over in um, Lisbon in Portugal. And that was my last gig that was cancelled at the very start of COVID. So they've come back, they said, right, we're all on. We're ready to go and, and we're, we're going off. So many of us, although we've been dealing with, you know, as your group is now online, most many of the groups that I'm involved with have already started to come back out and meet, not necessarily every week or every month, but, you know, on a periodic basis, meet face to face. Now, I can't say that transition has been easy for people because people have had to think about a lot of different things when they've been starting to move into a face-to-face -face environment. So they've just got used to dealing with things in a little square box or a little rectangular box that you're looking through now. But to get back face-to-face -face is going to take an extra little bit of inner courage. So I've prepared a little presentation just to show you some of the things that you might think about. And this is one that I did for a networking group um, that, I, that I'm in, where I'm also involved with their Coventry group. We call it Love Biz Arden. Um, and we meet um, once every two months um, over at the IBIS in, in Coventry. And the rest of the time, of course, we're just carrying on on Zoom. So we're having a bit of a mixture. And I think that's really nice. People can get together, but they can also then stay at home comfort in, in Zoom as well. So I'm just going to share my screen when I find it. Oh, there it is. There we are. There we are. So it's nearly time to step out and get out there and start meeting people again. And so what are we going to have to think about? Well, the, one of the first things I had to think about when I was going out to my very first event is what on earth was I going to wear on my feet? Because I'm four foot 11, I usually wear heels if I'm going to speak or train, um, but to be quite honest, I haven't had tall shoes on for such a long time now, but what, 25 months that, uh, sorry, yeah, 20, 24, 25 months that I haven't, I haven't had heels on. So what are you going to wear? What, what's, what, what's everything, what's happening out there in the world when we step out? So what you're going to wear is quite funny because most of us have been for all of this time, you know, in, in our uh, jeans, T-shirts. Some people I've seen with the pyjamas on. Some people have had suit jacket tops on and wearing shorts underneath. There's all sorts of things because when you're in your home, you can just do what you like, can't you? But when you're out, you've got to think a little bit more about well, what am I going to wear and you know, how, how, how am I going to deal with myself? So, so one of the things I've been trying to do is, is get some of our, our members ready back into thinking about what they're going to wear. And uh, you know, in a business sense, that's quite easy. You just get back into your business clothes. But it's that transition between, oh gosh, I'm going out tomorrow. What am I going to wear? You know, that event tomorrow I'll have to get something out because most of us have had our stuff that we wear to work tucked away for such a long time so I've actually seen somebody wearing shorts and the top like this a shirt uh, because they got up to answer the door 
and I saw him in the shorts. So it was really quite funny. And then we've got to think about what about giving somebody a hug? But well, what happens if I meet? So there I am, I walk into the event, I see Madeline, I'm like, oh, yeah, Madeline. And I go towards hugging her, Madeline sort of stands there, and she's not quite sure what she's going to do. All right. So that's what we've been saying to people is, you know, let's not do the hugging or just ask, is, uh, are we hugging? And if Madeline says, no, no, please, then that's absolutely fine. We don't have to do the hugging because most of us are not used to being um, together. And I was watching a television program only earlier this week where it must have been filmed before COVID and people were all in, in a melee together. I mean, it shocked me. I thought, oh, what are they all doing close together? Ooh, you know, and, and just seeing things on the television that wouldn't be our normal situation before COVID left me with a bit of dread. So about hugging, you don't have to, and you can just keep this back. And if somebody asks, you can always say no, or, you know, um, I prefer not to, if you don't mind. And that's absolutely fine. Everybody's getting on with that and they're, and they're doing that perfectly. And then of course we see this sort of thing where, you know, all this elbow bumping. And I think there is only the prime minister is actually bothering with the elbow bumping. And um, he, looks, he looks a right daft idiot doing it, but uh, he also makes a scene of it when he's in a hospital and the elbow bumps with the staff. Um, but I think there's only him doing it. So not necessary. And this bit frights me to death. I mean, going through, you know, a London street or a Coventry street that's full, thankfully, they haven't been all that full. Because even though in times we've come out of COVID, we haven't been in a situation too much like that. But it still fears me with dread. But I was looking at this scene um, towards the end of summer, out of my front window. And this was... Um, five young ladies obviously meeting up one of them's had the birth of the first child and they'd all come to come and meet and catch up and find out what was going on and look at the positioning of them they were all having a lovely chat they were all nice and social distanced and and you know they were respectful of each other and I was so taken by this photo I actually went out and said will I be able to take a photo of them so they give me permission for that um, and I thought, how lovely, because we can still go out into social environments and we can keep a nice space and keep ourselves safe. So I thought, well, let's have a look at some other positions that we could be in where we're keeping ourselves quite open and safe. So body positions when we meet in groups are quite, are really quite useful. And this is some things that I teach when I do my networking training because there are certain groups that when we walk in a room, we could go to and certain groups where we wouldn't go to. So I thought I'd share a little bit of that with you. So first of all, we've got in this scene, we've got a person stood on their own who's on a mobile phone and these two people here. This person on their own is what we call the single person on their own. Generally, um, they would be uh, looking at the phones, looking at the wall, reading something, um, and really wouldn't be giving any eye contact out. And you probably, as you walked in, you wouldn't go to that person because they look like you don't want anybody to talk to. That's what they look like on the outside. But on the inside, if it was a meeting and they were stood on their own, probably by a pillar or the side of the room or wherever. They actually would be the easiest person to just go up and have a bit of a chat with. They say, hi there, um, I'm Sue, can I join you? And just doing that, you know, it's a bit of a relief because although the body language might say, don't talk to me, inside they're saying, please will somebody talk to me. So that's a really great person to talk to. What we wouldn't do though, is we wouldn't go and talk to these two because they're in what we call a closed two. So two people facing each other, they're obviously having a private, intimate conversation there they don't want anybody to join. So when you see two people facing each other, we could just leave them to it. It's not a group that we could join. So, and that's the same with this group. So you can see it's a little bit better there. Now, these two here are chatting away and they're in an open two. And they're saying, hey, come and join us. Because if you think about geometry, 
a single person on their own is a bit like a dot on the floor. These are like a straight line. It's a closed two, it's a straight line. And an open two that we've got here is two sides of a triangle. And there's a bit missing at the other side, at this gap bit here. And that's a welcome mat because that group says, hey, welcome, come and join us. So that will be a really nice group to go to. And you can still do that, meet that group in social distancing. It's just like a, a two people and then the third joins like a triangle. Now, um, during COVID on the first year, um, I was invited to go down to, uh, to train and speak at Dyson. You know, the Hoover people and the hairdryer people. And Dyson himself uh, wanted me to turn up there um, in the middle of COVID uh, the first, in the first year. He wanted me to turn up in person. He didn't want a, a, an on a Zoom event. So they cleared out a whole hangar because he flies in to the place over in the, in the cop, in near Bath, Malmesbury. He flies in, so they have a, a, a hangar. So they cleared out the hangar for me and also gave me two sound men so that the group that I was training, we could all speak and talk to each other. And when we arrived, that group had been working together quite closely anyway, so they were all in a bubble. But I just stood and watched all of these body positions, I'm going to talk to you, and how that would be affected in COVID with social distancing. And hey ho, all there was exactly the same body positions, but not so, but social distancing. So there was just a lot of wideness going through. So here is what we call an open three. So that's three people there, three sides of a square, and somebody could just move in and say, hi there, can I join you? And that's a nice position to be in. So an open two, an open three, a fabulous groups to go and join and have a chat. So this is, this is what should be an open four, which is a semicircle, but these two girls have closed it in a bit. So that would be quite a difficult group to go and join. And we tend to find women close groups down far more quickly than men do. Because when we're chatting to somebody, we feel quite comfy, we close it down. It's a bit like giving our, ourselves a big hug. So this is the group that's open here with these four people. That's a semicircle, and that's a nice open four. And this person here on their own could turn around and go and join that group. And, and it's just about feeling comfortable with people and still being able to have that bit of a chat and feel that closeness back with people, but staying safe. And, and if we look at this picture here, we see a whole load of people. This is not necessarily COVID times, but here's my open four. There's a closed two, another closed two. Notice those are women. Um, all was, they all closed groups down. And we've got a triangle there um, and, a, and a three there, an open three. So if we look at that further on that picture there, we can see that sort of thing. There's a closed five who wouldn't go there. There's another closed five, won't go there. There's a closed two, a square, that's a closed four. And we've only got this little group here that we could actually, if we walked in that room, go and talk to. But so it's all about, uh, one of the things I teach is all about how our body language and our communication um, is also very important when we go to events. So I thought we could share that little bit with you because very soon you'll be in a situation where you might want to take some people um, to your inner wheel events when they go live um, and, and take friends and people and, and ensure that you can stay safe um, and you can get as much enjoyment, sorry, much enjoyment out of, um, uh, out of your events as possible. Uh, because it's really important, I think, that we do get back to, together again, but we do it in a very safe environment. Some things to talk about, very easy. Every single person that you ever meet has the same four things in common with you. You've never met them before or you've not seen them for ages. You've got the same four things in common. So you can start off conversations. Now, us girls, we don't need to have a problem. We don't have problems with starting conversations. But sometimes, you know, if we're a bit unsure, we don't know where to go in our conversations. But remember, every single person that has gone to your meeting 
onto your event or even has it attended your event on Zoom, as that they've lived somewhere, they've traveled from somewhere somehow. So um, that's the first thing is where are you speaking from or where have you traveled from today is the first thing we've got in common because every one of us are in a place or have got to a place. The next one is the host. Every single one of us at any event has the same person or organization that's invited us. So, so what's your link to the inner wheel? How do you know such and such? How, uh, you know, what's your link to Joyce? So everybody's got the same. The third thing we've all got in common is the day, the time, the month and the season. So the first thing you can always ask, and that's, I did it this morning, how was your Christmas? When I was walking the dog, oh, how was your Christmas? You know, how was your new year? And you stand and have a little chat to somebody, you don't know them very much. I tend to know dogs' names more than their owners' names. And she so oh yeah, how did you get up? How was your new year? Oh, it was very quiet, da, 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 da. And so we just chat about, about things. So everybody, it's for everybody today that's on this Zoom, it's Thursday. It's January, we've just had Christmas, right? And um, it might be building up to an event like the weekend. So we're all getting ready for the weekend again. So what, what are you doing over the weekend? And then Beryl, we might say. And Beryl says, oh, I'm, I'm, having, the, I'm having the family around. We couldn't see them at Christmas, wherever. And we have a little chat about it. So these are things that everybody's got in common so that we don't have to worry about what we're going to speak about. And you'll notice the last one is the weather. Now, everybody thinks over the world when I go and train that, you know, they also, the English people, that always talk about the weather. And it's true, we do talk about the weather. There were reasons why we talk about the weather. First of all, years and years ago, um, we used to be a bit more standoffish than we are now. And the weather was one of these um, easy things that says, I, I, I talked to somebody, but actually I, didn't, I could stay my distance. Um, so that's why when people go into a pub, it might be a countryside pub where they don't get a lot of um, people from outside their village in. And you walk in and they're all quiet and they look at you and they say, nice day in it or something. And the weather is the bit that just makes the link without meeting too much. But there are other reasons why we talk about the weather. And that's the fact that, of course, everybody shares the same thing. So this morning, we all got up over in the Coventry area and we had a thick frost. Okay? So I could say, oh, what was, was it frosty? Oh, it's frosty to our place this morning. I nearly slipped when I went out to get. So the, all of that sort of stuff we can talk about and it allows us to join in and share. And the other thing that we do with the weather is that we change the subject with the weather. And it's a dead easy thing. So when you're fed up with what we're talking about, you say, oh, look, sun's shining. It looks like it's going to be bright in Oxford. And suddenly, you know, what are you doing at the weekend? And we can change the subject. And we do that quite often using the weather. So getting back to, uh, getting back to um, networking and getting out there, I'm just going to stop sharing. Getting out there and, and, and having your meetings again, I think it's really lovely and you'll love it when it's actually happens um, and you can do it and be safe and make sure that each of you is safe just by asking the questions. Now, when I go into some countries, the women and the men are not allowed to shake hands. And it, so it's the skills that the women, the business women have there as somebody's approaching them to shake hands, they just move the hand further up to the, or just uh, up to the, the chest, they just move the hand up there. And that says, I, you know, oh, I don't want to shake hands. And actually we can do exactly the same. We can just stay a little bit of a distance um, and then somebody can move, moves to our approaches and just put your hand over your, over your chest area, just nice and softly. And then that says to them, you know, I'm really not, uh, I'm really not comfortable with being too close. So we can learn lots of things from other cultures where you know touching somebody is just not done and, and i think that's really quite quite nice to see that they have managed it all these years and now it's our turn to, to manage it in exactly the same way so i hope that's been useful um, i hope you've enjoyed seeing my little um, my little broccoli growing 
I can't wait for it to, to go. I have got a little tiny bit of the cauliflower in there, but it is tiny and you wouldn't be able to see it even in raw tips by the time everything. Um, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed what we've talked about today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. That's very interesting. Um, has anybody got any questions for Sue before we move on? <coughs> yes, Judy. Um, going back to your hydro veg, uh, I, I wondered what size this um, irrigation system, call it that, is. Is it the size of a, a downpipe? Um, yeah. And, yeah. And also, is it situated outside? Yes. Right. Okay. So yes, it's a, it's it's um, four inches wide mm -hmm. is the pipe, and that's so that the roots have got plenty of room to grow, and the water isn't pulling that; it's just running along the bottom. Right. So the roots are in the water, but the pot isn't suspended in the water. The, the, the pot's just a little bit out of the water by, by about half an inch. Um, and so that way we've got multiple plants that we grow. In this pot here, I've got three broccoli. Now, if you were growing in your garden, you would space those broccoli out. But in hydroponics, nothing's growing in the pot. The roots coming down, and the plant is growing up. So we actually can put multiple plants in the same pot. So we actually get more growth in less space. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's all outside. That's why mine's frozen this morning. And um, I only do it for outside growing. I don't do inside growing um, because um, I'm leaving that to <coughs> people. And also it is the water recycled. Yes. Uh, I mean, yes. Yes, right. so the water is running around the system all the time with the nutrients. Right. So we do need access to a bit of electric, but it's a, it's a, a pond pump with very, very little electric use. And that just moves the water, but we only have that on in the day. Um, in the night, the water goes back into the box. So this morning, the water across the top of the box was actually frozen, but mm -hmm. underneath it was fine. The only time we've ever switched it off completely is a couple of years ago. We had the beast from the east and we were at minus 14 <coughs> plus plants at the stage with our whole water box frozen. We switched it all off. Uh, the plants went to sleep and when it defrosted, we switched it back on again. And we never lost a plant because don't forget that these plants are winter plants anyway, they need to in the ground. Mm -hmm. right. But Judy, those are cracking questions. <laughs> Well, Judy, well, I, I was um, intrigued. Oh, you, oh, oh sorry, Carol. Oh, uh, Judith, you asked about the size. Well, the big one is the size of a fence panel, or oh, you meant the size of the, the pipe. Okay. okay. Yes, That's yes, fine. yes. Carol, yeah. what can I do for you? Uh, mine was about the size. Um, do they come in um, a kit for a person who lives alone as opposed to a kit for a family of five? Is it all one size kit? Oh, no, we've got two. So this one here. It's more likely to be put one for a person on their own. And so they can grow. And in the summer, they've got some nice flowers they can put there. So everything you throw in a hanging basket, you can have. And then on the opposite side of that, you can have your tomatoes, your courgettes, cucumbers, your purple sprouting broccoli, your cabbage, Whatever. and all of those sorts of things. So you can actually have a mixture. So you don't need to put it all with veg. Um, but what we do is we grow the veg and then we chop it, particularly if it's the greens, like the brassicas, your cabbages, your cauliflowers, your broccoli. We always eat all the leaves and we yeah. always eat the stems too. But we chop it up and we blanch it and we chop it up really fine, blanch it for a couple of seconds, uh, cool it back down, dry it, put it in the freezer. So we're yeah. eating fresh veg all the way in the winter here um, from that. So, mm. so while other things are growing, we're carrying on eating. I understand. Thank you. Jill's Jill, got a question, question. for you. Jill? Um, yeah, I, it's about the um, powering. You mentioned, do you need a pump? Yeah, there's, yeah. There's a, there's a pump in with the kit, but it's a kit. So you get everything you need 
and you need to have an electrical point which is within 30 feet. So All right, as long yeah. as you've got an electrical point within 30 feet, I picked the, the pump with the longest lead because <coughs> sometimes people where they're growing isn't necessarily right by the house. So it's 30, as long as you're within 30 feet, you're fine. So for example, I mean, we've, we turned our pond into a vegetable patch okay. um, during COVID. Yeah. And um, I'm just thinking that, you know, something like that, it add on a fence panel would add an extra dimension to it. We have got outside electricity because um, we used to have the electric for the pump for the pond, oh, obviously. Absolutely. So it's still there. Yeah. So that would be possible then, wouldn't it? So yeah, yeah. it comes with its yeah. own frame. So it's freestanding. So you can put it wherever you like. Hmm. It and doesn't go on a fence panel. It comes in its own frame. Own frame. Yes. Yeah, the size side of the panel. But so the you, new one is six foot by six foot by five foot. It has to can't be any bigger than five foot because I'm only five foot and I won't be able to reach any higher. Yeah. But you said when these are used in developing countries, they didn't need electricity just because they use solar power for the pumps. We can't use solar power for the pumps, sadly, because there isn't a pump that is strong enough using solar power to push up to the level that we need it to All start right. at. And so there isn't actually a solar pump in the world at the moment that can do that job for mm. us. So at the moment we have to use electric. But where we were saying no electric is where they're using the new gel. If the new right. gel works, mm -hmm. it won't need electric because mm. it will feed the water itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Bevan, well, have you got another question? No, no, I'm just waving my arm about, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I'd just say that I have actually seen this um, hydropods and this system and it's brilliant and the, I've seen it, you know, and in the summer, the, the plants and the flowers and the vegetables, tomatoes and cucumbers that are grown on it is absolutely incredible. Um, it's been a few years now since I've seen it, so but it, it, no. it's incredible what you can actually I remember we brought a whole kit. Yeah. With the plants and the water and everything, and, and we ran it through there. It was it was a fabulous day. They still talk about it, and they're still complaining that we haven't got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless, bless. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because some people really want to carry on growing their own food, but they really can't manage a garden anymore. Or, you know, I mean, this is ideal for anybody that wants to garden and are in a wheelchair, because they can reach everything, even from a wheelchair. And uh, you know, lots of people are worried about where the food's coming from these days. Well, I have to walk you know, a long way, like three feet, to go and pick up my little veg and then, and then take it back into the house. And you know, when you buy a broccoli in the shop, you get the broccoli head. Mm. Yeah? So all the fabulous nutrients in the leaves it is all wasted, but we eat all the leaves. So as the broccoli's growing, will start to eat the leaves from the bottom as greens because that's not going to affect, we won't strip it completely, else we, we won't get photosynthesis, but, um, but we'll eat the greens as we go through. So we've always got plentiful of green. And it's so sad to see when you go into a supermarket how much of the goodness is actually chucked away when they put things on the shelves, which is really fun. <coughs> mm. Thanks, Sue. If there's no more questions, then I'll invite Ethel to give a vote of thanks. Okay. Well, I, it's my pleasure to to thank you for your interesting talk. And it, it was great for me to see that I'm not the only one worrying about what shoes to wear when I first went out and met people, because I'm thinking I used to wear really, because I'm only five foot. And in fact, I think I've shrunk now. But um, I always wore high heels just so that I would be taller as much as anything else. And now I feel like I'm going to get a nosebleed if I wear high heels because it's just dry. So I've just resigned myself to wearing flats. But it is so interesting. And I really hope that this um, gel starts working because it'd be lovely for um, more hydroponic growing. I think it's the way to go. And, um, and thank you very much for your talk. It was Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
Thanks, sir.